Okay, welcome everyone to the Federal Election Forum. Just so everyone knows, we are recording this session. So we're gonna hit record. Um, thank you all for being here. Before we get started, we'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories in Alberta of many First Nations, Métis and Inuit, whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. Some of us are joining from Treaty 6 territory tonight, a, treaty, a traditional meeting ground, gathering place, and traveling route of the Cree, Soto, Métis, Dene, Nakota Sioux, and specifically the ancestral space of the Papas Chase Cree Nation. Others are joining us from Treaty 7 territory, the traditional territories of the Blackfoot nations, including Siksika, the Kani, and the Kainai, the Sutina, and Stony Nakota First Nations. Recognizing others still join us from Treaty 8 and Treaty 10, we honor and acknowledge all of the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples who have lived, traveled, and gathered on these lands for thousands of years. We also want to thank our partner organizations who have brought us here today to help us learn about the federal election candidates and what their platforms are. We are Public Interest Alberta, Voices of Albertans with Disabilities, Self-Advocacy Federation, the Alberta Ability Network, Disability Action Hall, Vibrant Communities Calgary, the Southern Alberta Individualized Planning Association, Self-Region Self-Advocate Network, Enough for All, Vibrant Communities Calgary, the Alex Community Food Center, Inside Out Theater, and Poverty Edmonton, and Albertans advocating for change together. I guess we'll briefly go over some uh, housekeeping. My name is Sam, I'm with the Voice of Albertans with Disabilities, um, and some of the features and controls we have in this webinar. As you should already be uh, able to see, we have live cart captions uh, available, thanks to Joanne. If you are not able to see those, there should be a CC or a live transcript button just on the bottom right of your Zoom controls. Uh, we also have our two ASL interpreters, Deborah R and Deborah F, who will be providing interpretation services this evening. If you have questions for the community discussion portion of our evening, please feel free to put them into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, just to the left of the captioning button. Should you have any technical or accessibility difficulties throughout the event, please send them via chat, first button on your left, to the panelists and one of our team will be able to work with you to rectify those. Poverty Lens can be used to examine all of the topics we included in our platform breakdown that will be sent out after the meeting along with other resources and documents. However, with the short amount of time that we have tonight, we have a focus on only a few topics today as listed on the registration. We encourage those that want to ask questions or bring up other issues to do so in the Q&A or chat boxes to, to be addressed during the community discussion period. So what is a poverty lens and why is it important? Well, with the ongoing reality of living through COVID-19 in Alberta, the depth and scope of poverty as a public interest issue has become more prevalent than ever before. For example, Vibrant Communities Calgary estimates that the number of Albertans living in poverty has grown by more than 70,000 since before the pandemic began. And while poverty is deepening in Alberta as a result of cuts to programs and services, a lagging economy, and inadequate supports for Albertans living through COVID, it has been a long standing problem in our society for a long, long time. As of 2018, according to uh, a recent study, 12.9% of Edmontonians live in poverty. This may increase as the effects of COVID-19 related to job loss are felt more and more. In 2020, the unemployment rate was 12%. And this is a problem across our province and has been for a while. Child poverty too is again on the rise in our province after a significant reduction based on measurements in 2016. And it speaks to the further depth of this problem. While politicians at all orders of governments and from all political parties identify and recognize poverty as a serious and growing problem, there's often much differences, many differences between the best path forward for solutions. And all too often the big political issues aren't really looked at through a poverty lens. But what's universally clear is that the same old patchwork approach just isn't working anymore. The effects of living in poverty are myriad and as many working in the sector identify, poverty is a trap that's really hard to get out of. 
increases in mental health challenges for families and individuals, increases in food insecurity, increases in the number of working poor, continued lack of affordable housing in urban and rural Alberta, women and children are disproportionately affected by poverty, and this pandemic has increased unemployment for women in particular. Mental well-being, physical well-being, poor nutrition, and cost to healthcare and criminal justice system uh, are on the rise. The list goes on. And now, while not all of us experience poverty in the long term or with the same level of seriousness, each of us is affected by it. We live in a society and we impact each other and are responsible for the health of our communities. Taking a social determinants of health perspective and an intersectional approach shows us how we're all connected. And if one system or group or individual is impacted by poverty to varying degrees, we all are. A person's right to health, housing, health care, and other services is impacted if experiencing poverty is a problem. We must address the person, environment, and we must address government structures to have a holistic understanding of poverty in order to address it. And that's why we're here tonight, to put this issue on the radar and to raise the alarm. Public Interest Alberta and all of the organiz organizations here today have come together to advocate and raise awareness tonight. In order to affect change, we need to get at the root causes of poverty and address systemic solutions because the power is in our hands. That's the beautiful and simple secret about our democracy. I think it was our friend Andrew, who's here with us tonight from Apathy is Boring, who said to us recently, if we come together with one voice, they can't help but hear us. And we know that there's no silver bullet to alleviating poverty and ending poverty, but there are well-researched and applied policies, programs, and investments that have been demonstrated to make a serious difference. Right now, we need the political will to get these policy programs and investments on the ground on housing, income, health care, child care, food security, accessibility, education, race relations, truth and reconciliation, and democratic reform. We can make a real difference. So please get engaged, ask questions. Thank you for being here tonight. And thank you for being here with your experience and, and your wisdom. Uh, we're really looking forward to being with you here tonight. Thank you very much, Brad. Um, I do want to briefly acknowledge and thank all the candidates running in Alberta that are joining us here today. I apologize, apologize if I miss any of you. Please be vocal in the chat and I will <laughs> go over it. Um, and I'm going in alphabetical order. So we have Aidan Bloom from the Green Party of Canada, Blake Desjardins from the New Democratic Party, Garnet Robinson from the New Democratic Party, Hugo Charles from the New Democratic Party, Jonathan Bridges from the People's Party of Canada, Kira Gunn from the New Democratic Party, Kevin Hunter from the Marxist Leninist Party of Canada, Kim Siever uh, running as an independent, Marie Grabowski from the New Democratic Party, Melanie Hoffman from the Green Party of Canada, Michelle Traxel from the New Democratic Party, Morgan Watson from the Libertarian Party of Canada, Naomi Rankin from the Communist Party of Canada, Sandra Hunter from the New Democratic Party, Peggy Askin from the Marxist Leninist Party of Canada, Sean McLean from the People's Party of Canada, and Tyler Beauchamp from the People's Party of Canada. We do have 10 minutes set aside for you candidates to offer your thoughts or comments after the community discussion we have planned for today. Um, as the discussion unfolds, please send a message to the panelists in the chat to let us know you'd like to be added to the speaker list um, for that period. Again, it is quite a short amount of time, and we hope that it is uh, related to the discussion. Um, okay. So we will begin our introduction of our speakers today. Uh, we are going to start with uh, the topic of housing with Anne Landry, who is a vote housing advocate um, and a supporter of the vote housing campaign. Anne Landry is a longtime renter in an apartment in Calgary, Alberta, with over 23 years experience trying to ensure her housing is affordable and adequate, and who has decided to support the vote housing campaign this year with a strong foundation of housing as a human right under the National Housing Strategy Act of 2019 and international law. And with that, I will pass it to Anne. 
Thank you, Sam. Good evening. My name is Ann Landry. I am a long term renter in the Beltline community in Calgary, a community with a high concentration of renters. Thank you for the land acknowledgement. I'm joining you uh, from the traditional territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Sutina, and the people who make their homes in Treaty 7. Uh, region of Southern Alberta and Métis Nation Region 3. I would like to thank the organizing committee for providing this opportunity to speak today. I will speak regarding why I have decided to vote housing this year and about the immediate stop the bleed protections needed for renters and the universe of affordable housing. First, a little bit about myself and the growing emergency of lack of affordable housing in Alberta and across Canada. For over the past 23 years, I have rented the same one bedroom and den apartment at Boardwalk Reed Skygate Tower in Calgary. I have spent much time, efforts, cost and stress, often in the media, trying to ensure my apartment is affordable, the terms of my lease are upheld, and my apartment is safe. I have a career background in strategic planning, continuous improvement, project management, and visual data analytics. I've been unemployed in my career since the 215 recession in Alberta. I suffer from and am trying to recover from post-traumatic stress. I will soon be of retirement age. I have paid Boardwalk over $280,000 in rent. I want my investment to be protected and to age in place in my apartment and in my community in which I have long lived. There is a growing emergency of lack of affordable housing in Calgary and across Canada. A recent Nanos poll revealed that one in three renters are worried about making their rent next month. That is approximately 5 million renters across Canada. Nearly 7 in 10 Canadians think that it is urgent to end homelessness in Canada and invest in affordable housing. Note the game changers. Do you know apartment turnover in Alberta is unsustainably high? As per the CMHC, in 2020, during COVID-19, apartment turnover was 29.9% in Calgary, 25% in Edmonton. This is apparent literal destruction of communities at a time that housing is not a game to play. It is a basic human right under the National Housing Strategy Act 219 and international law. Did you know that the financialized REIT landlords are planning to significantly raise rent despite their high operating margins and low operating costs. As per its 2021 Q2 reporting, Boardwalk REIT's mark to market for Alberta is $125. As per its 2020 Q4 reporting for the 12 months ending December 31st, 2020, Boardwalk REIT reported operating costs of $491 per month and net operating margins of 57.8%. So why are rents so high and increasing? Are you aware of the award-winning research of Martine August, PhD assistant professor at the University of Waterloo School of Planning, entitled The Financialization in Canada's Multifamily Rental Housing from Trailer to Tower. This research revealed that the financialized model of renting housing is an apparent failed affordable housing business model and is apparently abusive of renters. So that is why this year, at the time of the federal and municipal elections in Alberta, I have decided to vote housing. I am asking candidates if they support the vote housing platform. Vote housing is the largest nonpartisan housing campaign in Canadian history. See about vote housing and its six point platform at www.votehousing.ca. In brief, the vote housing platform is implement an urban, rural and Northern indigenous housing strategy with indigenous led governance structure, commit to the prevention and elimination of homelessness, invest in a minimum of 50,000 units of supportive housing over a decade, build and acquire a minimum 300,000 units of deeply affordable non-market co-op and non-profit profit housing over a decade, expand rental assistance for low-income households, commit to the progressive realization of the human right to housing, including measures to curtail the financialization of rental markets and to ensure engagement of people with lived experience of housing need and homelessness, like you and me. Also, what is needed on day one of the next federal government is immediate stop the bleed measures to protect renters in the universe of affordable housing, including a rent freeze, existing and turnover, and eviction freeze, at least to the end of 2022. 
Also, first write a purchase of affordable housing for nonprofit landlords and municipal housing bodies. Immediately assign the federal housing advocate and start the long overdue review of the financialized model of housing that began in Canada in the 1990s. All levels of government should work together to achieve these urgent measures. Let's do the right thing. Housing is essential. A new model of housing renting is urgently needed in Canada based on human rights, pre-tax household income of renters and the operating costs of landlords. We need housing as a human right in human rights cities and accountability by design. We need a win-win-win for renters and owners, community, as well as landlords. This year, let's vote housing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. Uh, we will now jump to our healthcare topic um, with Sandra Azucar of Friends of Medicare. Sandra has been a social activist for more than 30 years in Alberta. Her previous experience is working as a child protection worker, a community organizer, and a labor activist. Prior to coming to Friends of Medicare, she served as vice president of the Alberta Union of Provincial Employees, AUPE. She was a member of the board of directors of Friends of Medicare for six years before becoming its executive director in 2012. Sandra is an oft quoted voice for public health care. She believes that while we have work to do sustaining and protecting Medicare, we should also look to expand the system so that Canadians health needs of all kinds can be met, regardless of ability to pay. Sandra is a board member for the Canadian Health Coalition, as well as sitting on the board of Public Interest Alberta and Edmonton Chilean Cultural Society. She is an activist, as this is the rent we pay for living on this planet. With that, I pass it to you, Sandra. Thank you so much for that lengthy introduction, Sam. Um, I just wanna thank all the organizers for allowing us to share a few words. Um, I think that all the areas that are being discussed tonight speak to the social determinants of health, as Brad mentioned, and the downstream uh, impact that when we don't deal with these issues, we are basically doomed as a society to ultimately leave people behind. As we continue to navigate COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen and lived uh, firsthand the importance of the universal health care as a public good for all, regardless of income, age, immigration status, or where we live. Unfortunately, what we also saw is that our public health care system does not meet everyone's needs. I would propose that this is a result of years of underfunding and attack from private interests, attack from those who seek to profit from the poor health of others and who see Canada as a fertile ground for profit making. I'm going tonight to speak from a place of values. Our healthcare system was established on the value of equity from the basic belief that if we can't be equal when we're sick, then when can we be equal? From a place where, as Tommy Douglas said, that no Canadian would ever have to go bankrupt or die because they can't afford health care. For this purpose, we need all levels of, of government to be committed to improving and defending public health care that we all rely on. It's not always the case, unfortunately. I only have five minutes, so I'm going to try and break down my presentation into quick little uh, tidbits that, that if you're interested in finding out more about it, you can certainly ask in the question and answers uh, uh, period. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about funding. So when it comes to funding, Canada's universal healthcare system requires federal vision and, and, and leadership, not only provincial. In 2014, we saw the expiry of the Canadian Health Accord, uh, which had been in place for about 10 years. And that was set up as a way of uniting the country in recommitting to our shared values and to encourage the uh, scaling of, up of best practices and implementing national standards to ensure that no matter where Canadians live, they can access high quality public health care. Unfortunately, that health accord expired, as I said, and no matter who has been in power, the declining share of federal funding for health care um, included in the bilateral agreements that were just negotiated uh, have not only served to increase fiscal pressures on provinces, which currently face significant pressures to cut needed public health care services. It has also served to reduce the authority of the federal government in upholding national standards to protect Canadians from user fees and extra billing. 
Bilateral agreements that are currently in place threaten the portability of Medicare, leaving a patchwork system where some services are public in some provinces or territories, but not in others. Now, and I would put forward the idea that in order to safeguard public health care for all, the federal government must agree to pay their fair share. And that is reflecting of their uh, commitment to meeting the real cost of health care. This requires uh, at least a 5.2% Canada health transfer escalator. We also need uh, the federal government to uh, commit, reaffirm their commitment to the Canada Health Act. And we must, uh, we want to see strings that must be tied to the Canada health transfer so that all uh, dollars for public health care are actually spent on public health care. We also want to see the federal government take federal leadership and provide national standards that, uh, that are needed to be implemented so people across Canada can access the same quality public health care service with reduced wait times. Uh, we want to see a, a government that will uh, create a national public uh, drug plan and a national public seniors plan. I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, and we support uh, substantial increases to the Canada health transfer contingent up upon the provinces and territories using the funding for health care and respecting the five principles of the Canada Health Act, which are universality, portability, accessibility, comprehensiveness, and public administration. When it comes to privatization, uh, we firmly believe that this uh, public health care system uh, is, must be well-funded and publicly administered uh, is the only way that it, it can provide the fairest and highest quality and most cost-effective uh, care. Private for-profit investors should not be allowed to undermine our public health care system. There should be no place for profit in health care, whether through private clinics, paid blood plasma collection, corporate delivery of virtual health care, or long-term care facilities. And seniors care, taken from that, is one of those areas where we have seen the most um, privatization. During this pandemic, uh, more than 14,000 long-term care and retirement home residents and staff died in the first two waves of the pandemic alone. And more than 80,000 re residents and staff have been infected in the pandemic to date. Many never to regain their former health status. Canada's record is staggering, much worse than our international peer nations. It underscores that the horrific toll of death and suffering in Canada's long-term care was preventable. Fully, 69% of our country's pandemic deaths occur in residents compared to the international average of 41%, and that, that is just simply shameful. This area has highlighted the human cost to privatization, and over the decades we have seen those who seek to profit from caring for the most vulnerable create a market system that will, in a few years, become unaffordable for quite a few of us. Increased uh, um, federal funding must be contingent upon provinces and territories using the funds for long-term care and meeting enforceable national standards. Home care should be appropriately funded as part of the national senior strategy. Home care has, is also one of those areas where we have seen the most privatization. The other area that we want to see uh, an expansion to is the public mental health services. Over one in five Canadians are not able to access the mental health services they need. We need a mental health care system that is fully integrated into our public health care system so that access to mental health is also based on need and not ability to pay. We also need a mental health care system that treats intersectional causes, not just the symptoms. These include systemic factors such as poverty, racism, trauma, colonialism, and the lack of secure and affordable housing. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about pharmacare. Pharmacare is one of those unfinished business of, of uh, health care. Um, before COVID-19 pande pandemic, more than 3 million people living in Canada were already dealing with inadequate uh, prescription drug coverage or no coverage at all and, and struggling to pay uh, medication. Canada is unfortunately the only country in the world with universal health care that doesn't uh, also have universal pharmacare. Our universality ends as soon as you're handed a, a prescription. So instead, we pay some of the highest prescription drug prices in the world. 
As a result, 1 million Canadians report cutting back on food or heat to afford their prescription. Our current patchwork system is inadequate and uh, inequitable. Over uh, one in five households in Alberta experience financial barriers to getting their prescription medications. If we want to have a public health care system that actually meets um, the needs of all Canadians, we have to um, be able to implement the National Pharmacare program. Study after study has, uh, has shown that, you know, that ultimately we would save money uh, if we implemented a, a National Pharmacare program. Study after study, report after report, have indicated that they would be in the best interest of all Canadians. Uh, and, and yet we have seen a, a, a huge uh, public um, unwilling, a political unwillingness to actually implement a, a national pharmacare. We would see exponentially a public health care system that would be improved through universal uh, and public drug coverage. Just as essential vaccines have been provided free of charge, National Pharmacare will prevent and treat disease while lo lowering the cost of families, employers, and governments. Canadians could see a saving of anywhere between seven to $11 billion if we actually implemented a National Pharmacare. So that's basically what we're calling on the government, uh, on the federal government to do. So whoever is, is actually, um, you know, putting their name forward as a candidate, uh, we want to see um, that they support some of these initiatives that not only will improve the overall health of all Canadians, that it will address the issue of poverty and inequality in, in a country uh, such as Canada. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sandra. Next, we're going to hear from Diane Altwasser, who's joining us from the Women's Centre of Calgary. Diane is the operations manager for the Women's Center of Calgary, and she's here to talk to us about early learning and childcare. Hello, thanks very much for uh, inviting us to this presentation. We're very pleased to be uh, included in the, in the pre presenters for the, this evening. And I'm going to be um, quite brief. Um, I just wanted to uh, speak a little bit about child care and just let you know that at the Women's Center, um, we've been really focused on um, uh, just recovery, uh, just economic recovery from the pandemic. And when we bring people together to talk about that, women together to talk about that, um, one of the biggest issues that rises to the surface is the is the need for um, uh, child care that is universally accessible publicly funded and coordinated to meet the needs of parents and caregivers. And uh, the importance of universal child care goes beyond recovering from COVID. We know that robust and well-funded universal health care leads to better outcomes for children, women, family, and communities. And so women, and, women will be better positioned to participate in the workforce, seek training, and participate outside of the home when affordable childcare is available. Currently in Alberta, uh, women uh, families can expect to pay uh, $1,300 uh, a month for a fee for an infant, $1,250 a month for a toddler, and $1,145 for a preschooler in in the child care uh, to have child care in um, in Alberta. There are currently uh, only three spaces for every ch every 10 children of employed mothers and there is regulated space for only one in five of all children zero to 12. So there's uneven access to child care and um, over half of Calgary's children live in the postal code with more than three children competing for every one space in childcare. So in order for there to be a difference in the ability for women to be able to return to the workforce, because as we know that the pandemic uh, unequally impacted women in, um, in our society and in employment, more women had to leave employment in order to take care of children, uh, universal childcare is very important. So uh, I just wanted to outline what the three, may, the what four parties that I was able to access some information on other platform are saying about childcare. 
The Liberal Party's platform uh, is uh, advocating for continuation of the $10 uh, per day childcare. And this commitment is featured in their platform. And the longer term goal was to fully, if you have fully implemented $10 per day childcare available nationwide by 2026. The NDP's platform is similar to that of the Liberal Party, focusing on the need for affordable, accessible, and universal $10 per day childcare in all communities. It also includes commitments to the creation of more childcare spaces to meet existing and future demand, as well as a living wage for childcare workers. The Conservative pl uh, platform seeks to dismantle the existing provincial agreement structure and instead grant parents and families a refundable tax credit covering up to 75% of childcare costs. It touts the need for choice and flexibility for Canadian families and parents. So in essence, there are two main ways of approaching a national childcare strategy as outlined in the platforms. And both the NDP and Liberal Party support $10 a day universal childcare model that would be accessible to all Canadian families and parents. The Conservative Party supports direct refund to families in the form of a tax credit covering up to 75% of childcare costs to families to a maximum of $6,000. So regardless of which childcare strategy you prefer, it's important to note that all parties agree that childcare is a national issue requir requiring a new strategy to meet the needs of the Canadians or meet the needs of Canadians. Um, the Green Party has not released its platform yet, but um, history would acknowledge that they are in favor of a national childcare strategy. And, um, a universal childcare and early uh, or early childhood education are crucial components of de of developing comprehensive care for all Canadians. So that's their their, their kind of take on childcare as well. So that gives you an overview of where the parties are standing on in terms of childcare. And at the center, we are um, uh, pleased that uh, childcare is part of all the party flat platforms and. Um, and are hopeful that any, anyone, any party that gets elected will move forward on um, universal child care that will benefit all Canadians. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are now gonna move on to our topic of food security, which will be presented by Danielle Fitzpatrick with the Alex Community Food Center. Danielle has been in anti-poverty and community development work for over eight years. She is most well known for her skills in community mobilizing and her informal and relatable way of exposing the effects of income security, insecurity. Her previous experience includes paid employment, community volunteering, and as a board member of nonprofits, both in her native Scotland and in the States. She is currently undertaking a master's in political science, focusing on community action and social inequity. Take it away, Danielle. Hi, thank you, Sam, and thank you, everyone, for coming tonight, and thank you for inviting me to this very special event. Um, as you can tell, I have quite a strong accent, so I'm going to save you. I, I have a PowerPoint, uh, so I'm just going to screen share, um, just so you can see with the, some of the things that I'm saying. Okay, so um, tonight, I'm going to be focusing on food insecurity in Canada. So the three ways I would do that is exposing some of the root causes, talking about the impact, and discussing some of the policy recommendations that we have. So first, um, what is food insecurity? Food insecurity is defined by this scale here. And it is related down to the aspect of not having enough income to supplement and get the food that you need. And it comes through as these three ways. Um, so you have the, the worrying aspect, you have not been able to get enough food, you have compromising the quality, you're re reducing your quantity or skipping meals, and then you have the, the far end, the severe food insecurity which is experiencing hunger. And it's, it's more than just being hungry. Um, if anyone on the call hasn't been through what it is like to experience true hunger, true belly aching hunger, 
this is that level of severe. So yeah, so what does it look like? So this is our map of Canada before, um, before COVID. Canada was seeing 4.4 million people suffering from either marginal, moderate or severe insecurity. So that can come around as one in eight. Um, unfortunately, COVID has really increased those numbers to now one in seven. We have already mentioned um, my friends on the call, food insecurity does, or income insecurity does in fact affect different populations and different demographics in different ways. And this is some of the key demographics that impacts the most. I always say, um, there's no stories without facts and there's no facts without stories. So the next couple of slides are some stories, some, some words that have been passed through um, and I'll supplement them with a couple of the facts that we've seen. Again, <laughs> I feel like we're, we're preaching to the choir. We have heard before that food is one of the first things that will be cut from someone's day-to-day -day life um, because of income and security. We, um, our fact, uh, one of the things that we'd like you to go away with is out of, we, we've done a survey out of 600 people throughout the whole of Canada, 36, so three six percent said that they would cut food before basic, like before other basic expenses, such as transport, medicine, utilities, housing. So food is always the first to go. It makes people sick. Um, the same survey, 600 people, 81 percent said that food insecurity had a negative impact on their physical health and 79 on their mental health like that is a very small difference sixty four percent said that it affected their relationships with loved ones and forty six out of an amazing multicultural Canada 46% said it impeded their ability to express and share their culture. And last story for you. Community, um, constantly worry about food becomes your only worry. And that's something that always sticks in my head. And 57% of those, of those who we chatted to said that it affected their ability to find and maintain a job. And 53% said it made their lives harder to move forward with that thought in their heads, always of food. We at the Alex Community Food Centre and many of our counterparts in the food access world in Calgary um, know that more food is not the solution to food insecurity. Food insecurity is, an inc is a symptom of income insecurity. Um, we see here the only way forward is to support income within Canada. And we have seen evidence with the Child Canada, ben uh, Can Child, blah, blah, Canada Child Benefit and the Seniors Benefit as well. We are really expressing and really advocating that we need four, um, four ways forward. We need to set a target to reduce food insecurity. The government has to invest in income policies that will help Canadians put food on the table and put more money in people's pockets. We really need to invest in social programs that make life much more affordable, like we've already mentioned about housing, childcare and pharmacare and ensure all progress is achieved equitably and benefits populations most affected by food insecurity, including Indigenous and Black people. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, that's me all done, thank you. Thank you so much, Danielle.
Next, we're going to talk a little bit about income and income security. We have Eric Amtman joining us from N Poverty Edmonton. He is the executive director. He's also a member of the Edmonton Police Commission, and he's worked in the settlement sector and in the Friendship Center movement for many years. Thanks for being with us, Eric. Uh, my pleasure. I should definitely acknowledge uh, one of my many partners in crime, uh, Megan Reed. We um, co-chair something called Basic Income Alberta. Um, and so I have the honor of uh, speaking to you, uh, but I think um, we tend to do a lot of these things together. Um, Daniel made some really good points about income. Um, when we talk about poverty, we know that poverty is not exclusively about income, but it's always about income. Income is always a, a very important piece of um, poverty. It's sort of obviously the definition of um of poverty comes from uh, an income number. Um, as I mentioned, we, Megan and I are both with uh, Basic Income Alberta. And I think that when the CERB came out, what we were able to see was that when there's a crisis, the most important thing is to get people money. That's how you should be dealing with a crisis. Um, when we had a pandemic, or when we continue to have a pandemic crisis, the response was to get people money because that's what they needed more than anything else. And that exists for people who are in crisis outside of pandemics. Um, and so that's the kind of thing that we would be advocating for. I, I think, you know, made some um, touch on a couple of interesting things too, when it comes to uh, income-based programs. Um, we tend to be very uh, punitive with our income programs. Um, we try to catch, let's say, the less than 1% that are seen to be potentially cheating, as opposed to designing programs that help the 99% of people who need those programs to, uh, to make their go uh, in, in Canada. Um, and so what I think we would want to see is more programs that actually work towards helping people as opposed to um, putting them at a disadvantage. Uh, a really good example is uh, Alberta's social housing policies which essentially either trap you in social housing um, or really strongly decentralize you from say getting extra hours or um, getting a job that pays better or even accepting a, a promotion. Uh, in income, it's very similar. Um, my background is as an economist and the, the example that's used for how not to design a program is Canada's um, uh, EI program. Uh, which essentially strongly decentivizes uh, you from um, doing anything other than collecting um, income, yeah, uh, employment insurance. Um, and I think a lot of our programs continue to be designed in that uh, manner where we punish people for, say, uh, an artist who sells the painting or somebody who gets a part-time job, um, we essentially one for one take whatever supports they're getting away from them. Um, and so it's, it's nuanced, but creating income support programs that actually help people to get ahead as opposed to essentially trap them in a, a system. Basic income uh, being, I think, the, the best example where essentially you say, People should have the ability to provide certain things for themselves or for their families. And so if we give them that amount of money, that's the baseline for what it takes to essentially survive in Canada. It's not, it's not getting rich or anything like that, but it's, it's enough to get by. Um, and so programs like that, uh, that, that set that baseline, um, but don't look to punish people who, uh, who are recipients. And I'm, I'm looking forward to the, the conversation. I think that's the big takeaway I would hope um, people here have is that we need to design programs that help, not programs that sort of do the bare, bare minimum um, and then punish those who are recipients of those programs, income support programs. Thanks very much, Eric. Really appreciate it. Um, next, we're gonna be talking a little bit about accessibility. Um, Sam Mason from the Voices of Albertans with Disabilities has been the accessibility coordinator at Voices of Albertans with Disabilities for three years. They have a Bachelor of Commerce where they focused on marketing, economics, and sociology. Combined passion for creating a truly inclusive society and her experience in business, 
has allowed her to advocate to the private and public sectors to commit to accessibility and inclusion. They're currently the board president for the Coalition of Justice and Human Rights and a director at the Sexual Violence Advocacy and Accountability Network. Over to you, Sam. Thank you very much. You guys are gonna get sick of seeing me today. Um, so I will begin um, saying, as with many of the issues that we are speaking to today, there are intersections between accessibility and all of the other topics being covered. Uh, regardless of an individual's level of education, employment, statistics, education or employment, statistics show that persons with disabilities are more likely to live in poverty, 23% as opposed to 9% for people without disabilities, and up to 35% depending on the kind of disability. Accessibility in the terms of removing barriers for people with disabilities means access to appropriate housing, access to a livable income, access to suitable health care, and I could go on. It is imperative to me and to Voice of Albertans with Disabilities that when we're speaking about accessibility, we are not solely talking about the built environment or ramps or elevators. Um, I think that's where a lot of people's minds go. But when we speak about accessibility, we understand that people require access to goods and services, information, employment, transportation. And again, I could go on. People with disabilities are the largest minority group. It is one that anyone can join at any time and for any length of time. It is also a group we will all likely join in our lives as we are living longer. As other speakers have mentioned, the lives of people with disabilities are left up to all levels of government in a patchwork system. Income is different from province to province. Healthcare is different from province to province. In Alberta alone, we have over 30 legislations or acts that are meant to address issues impacting people with disabilities. And that is as we discover new challenges, a new act is implemented and it doesn't really address the old act and it's just a big patchwork and it's kind of a mess. <laughs> we saw in 2019, the current federal government enacted the Accessible Canada Act. That was two years ago. In contrast, our neighbors to the south, the United States passed a nationwide and fairly all encompassing act 30 years ago this year. So we are at minimum 30 years behind on accessibility. This act, while championed um, and welcome, I think, by the community, it only governs things under federal jurisdiction. It also was rolled out two years ago with very little um, details involved, uh, and they haven't even hired the people that are meant to uh, advise on this act. So it's, it's very slow moving. Things under federal jurisdiction mean banks, uh, communications and broadcasting, national transportation, uh, but it ignores things, really, really impactful things like our health care and our employment. Um, and it ignores private or the business sector altogether. Um, we require uh, a much stronger act. Uh, there's not a lot of um, regulation for this act. But there's not a lot of information at all about this act. So um, in this upcoming federal election, we have our current government and uh, the new Democratic Party or the NDP have made some uh, commitment to strengthening that act and implementing it. Um, the other parties or all parties are kind of looking at, uh, as we were just talking about a basic income, um, a supplement for the disability community. So where, as we're speaking in an Alberta context, we have the Alberta Insur Insurance for the Severely Handicapped or AISH. Uh, they're looking at adding a top up and that was tabled at the federal government before the election was called. Uh, and the most of the parties have agreed that that is a good idea. So it, it would top up income like the guaranteed in, income supplement for uh, our seniors. Uh, depending on the party, uh, it varies on how much. A lot of the other party promises look to tax benefits or um, access to making it easier to access certain programs like the Disability Tax Credit and RDSP. And again, I know it sounds like I'm speaking income, but that is sort of, it's, it crosses all over. Um, those, those programs, while in improving access to them is obviously not gonna be a bad thing, uh, doesn't necessarily meet the core needs of people living with disabilities in Alberta. 
Um, we do have our enabling accessibility fund, which has come out of our uh, 2019 act, which allows small businesses or anyone really who has a brick and mortar building to access that fund to improve their accessibility standards. And again, the different parties have committed to either increasing that or maintaining that, which is a good thing. Um, and then when we look to sort of things outside of the income and the built environment, there's a disability action inclusion plan that's been tabled by the liberals uh, that they are looking to uh, push forward. And uh, the NDP have promised to uphold the UN Convention of the Rights for Persons with Disabilities, which Canada signed on to in 2010, uh, have done very little with. And then in 2019, I believe we had a special rapporteur come and give us a failing grade on uh, upholding that UN Convention. So the NDP has committed to, in their party platform, to uh, upholding that convention and strengthening that Accessible Canada Act that I was speaking of. Um, uh, essentially along the lines of the different main federal platforms, we're seeing uh, we're seeing a lot of income promise, like a livable wage. Um, but outside of those things, we're not seeing a lot of teeth. And I think that's what we've noticed in a lot of party promises, just in general, on all levels of government uh, is, they sound great, uh, but there's not a lot of weight that backs those. So in this upcoming federal election, all of these issues impact the disability community and they're all something that we need to be paying attention to um, as a community because like we said food security and income and all of those things impact a person's basic life and as we said people with disabilities are more likely to live in poverty and not have access um, to income and food security so these are all issues that we need to be paying attention to and specifically in terms of accessibility um, we need to look to see what the teeth is and not listen to just the, the words on a page that seem really, really promising, uh, but we need to hold our party accountable to having some teeth to back those up, uh, putting those regulations in. And honestly, more than anything, we need to listen to parties and candidates that are, listen, are willing to hear the voices of people with disabilities um, express what it is that they need because i think for, we know this is an old adage in the community nothing about us without us and for a very long time the voices of this community has been ignored and i believe that now we are in a special election we have another election in alberta right now so these this is the time to be loud and say what you need and hold your uh candidates uh accountable that's the word i'm looking for uh, and with that, I think I will just end it. And I look forward to your questions. Great. I, do you want me to? I'm oh. introducing the next person anyway. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> I will continue speaking for a moment. Uh, so we are gonna just quickly move to our next topic, education with Jace, Jason Schilling, the president of the Alberta Teachers Association. Jason Schilling was elected president in 2019 prior to his election as pres prior to his election as president of the UTA. Schilling taught English and drama uh, at Kate Andrews High School in Coaldale, where he worked for 17 years. And I'll pass it to you. Great. Thanks, Sam. Um, good evening. I'm joining you from the um, from Treaty 6 territory, the ancestral ter and traditional territory, the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, the Soto, Nakota Sioux, as well as the Métis. I'm grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are still with us today and those who've gone before us. I want to thank you for having me at, your, at this important forum this evening. The association is a long-standing policy on the eradication of poverty that addresses not only the student, but their families as well. When we hear statistics that one in eight Calgary children or one in six children in Edmonton live in poverty, it's not just the child who's affected, it's their families, and in the broader sense, their community as well. When we look at the impact of poverty on a student, we also need to keep in mind where they come from before they set foot into the classroom. The ATA conducted research throughout the pandemic and teachers raised concerns about the impact of the pandemic on students, especially those who are most vulnerable. 
80% of respondents indicated that those students living in poverty were impacted negatively by the pandemic. School nutrition programs were drastically impacted or even canceled. The pandemic also impacted early learning and childcare, two areas that are important to families and teachers, and they need to be addressed to help alleviate poverty pressures and improve educational outcomes. Furthermore, teachers reported in our Pulse surveys last school year of a great concern about their students' mental health. In discussions throughout the year, members reported families struggling to make ends meet, with some teachers reporting an increase in self-harm, depression, food insecurities, and the constant roller coaster of learning in person and then pivoting suddenly to learn online. The ATA heard many concerns from teachers and parents about students potentially slipping through the cracks. And as much as schools tried to be proactive, the pandemic and its necessary limitations for interactions made meeting the needs of students and families more difficult. As a result, the ATA called on government and its nine expectations of Alberta teachers for the return to school plan to create a comprehensive school plan where particular and special attention must be paid to the broader impact of poverty and the precarious family situations on students, some whose most basic needs are not being adequately or consistently met. Comprehensive school health programs should be funded and supported to support families in managing employment, shelter, and food uncertainty, as well as other, other health issues. While schools provide a convenient community nexus for the provision of various social support services, it is not the job of teachers alone. Instead, specialized professionals with access to relevant information, external contacts, and resources are required in schools to establish and maintain systems of support for students and their families. When you review UNESCO's Sustainable Develop Development Goals that were adopted in 2015, many of these goals take a comprehensive look at the aspects of a person's life, not just solely education. The SDG goals cover poverty, education, health, gender equality, clean water, energy, and climate change, along with several others. The Alberta Teachers Association works closely with the Canadian Teachers Federation, who in turn works with Educational International to address the sustainable development goals and hopes to achieve these goals by the set date of 2030 for people who live across the globe. However, with so many factors out there, pandemic, climate change, failing economies, the achievement of these goals are in jeopardy. The pandemic amplified it the needs of many, especially those in poverty. And though I hear a lot of talk about returning to normal, I and mean, I know how badly we want to see the pandemic end. However, what we saw as normal before should not be something we return to. We can't return to the status quo, such as hearing government officials making statements about, the, about eradicating poverty, but then failing to provide funding and budgets to action those statements. We need government to recognize that when we address poverty, we are also addressing health, financial, social, physical, mental, and spiritual health. Addressing all aspects of a person's life in a comprehensive health model should be our new normal. As a teacher with over 20 years in the classroom, this topic is intensely personal. The statistics we quote, the slides we present can capture the number and the magnitude of the issue. But these statistics and numbers on a spreadsheet represent people struggling to make ends meet. These stats are our students, my students that we're talking about. I had one specific student who was homeless, was couch surfing, living in his car at times, struggling in every way possible. But he still came to school, and we were glad to see him. We worked hard to eliminate any shame he might have felt at the time. We made sure he was fed, was able to shower. We connected his family with the services in the community to provide a much-needed support. Through all of this, the one thing he wanted the most when he came to school was to learn. Over the years, I've given students uh, without lunch mine. Purchased food to keep in my room just in case someone was hungry. Quietly donated clothes, backpacks, toiletries for students to use. Worked with our students' council as we collected money and donations for the local food bank or created Christmas hampers. I've had students who do not have much. Students who are hungry. Students who worked full-time jobs to provide for their own families. When you teach, you see kids at their best. But you also see kids at their lowest points. And yet through all of these challenges, these are also students who want to learn, to be in school, and work towards a chance to have a better life. They're working to raise themselves up, and it's the responsibility of the rest of us to lift them up, to help them, to give them the means to create even more for themselves.
Education has a role, but we cannot continue to download the responsibility without support on schools and teachers. Schools need support that comes in the way of funding for services, professional development for professionals, access to education assistance, and the inclusion of other agencies and paraprofessionals provide the means to support the entire school. It'll take more than just schools and teachers to address and eradicate poverty among our students. Action is needed on all levels of government and school authorities. Throughout the pandemic, we constantly heard that we're all in this together. And we are. However, that togetherness needs to carry forward past the pandemic and into a recovery phase. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Jason, for being with us tonight. It was wonderful. Um, next, we're going to hear from Buddy Dixon to talk a little bit about truth and reconciliation through a poverty lens. Buddy is the Indigenous Engagement Facilitator for Vibrant Communities Calgary and also a steward, steward for Enough for All. Buddy is from the Stony Nakoda, Gaina, and Sutina First Nations and has been raised in Tree Seven territory. He has been connected to his culture through traditional teaching from his grandparents and community. He strives to support others in their learning journey to sustainably incorporate Indigenous perspectives and ways of working into their organizations in Mokin's thesis. As a member of Treaty 7, his aim is to ensure that there is truthful and respectful collaboration between the Indigenous and non-Indigenous people of the area. Through his traditional teachings and Western education, he has an understanding of how to balance both worlds and is proud to bring his understanding to organizations working to reduce poverty among our Indigenous communities. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, Brad. Oki, Ambostich, Dani Dada, and Tanse to uh, everybody out there. Like Brad said, I'm, I'm from Treaty 7 here. Um, and my topic's on truth and reconciliation. What does that mean? What does it look like? It's a big topic. Um, it can be overwhelming, but as you know, a lot of Indigenous poverty is rooted in systemic racism, systemic policies, um, systemic histories, and history. So how do we move past that? How, how do new leaders, new governments um, build those bridges and remove those barriers? It's, you know, ever since the treaties, the treaties were signed in the 1800s, we're still working on trying to accommodate one another. We're still trying to fulfill each other's um, portion to those treaties. Um, and we, you know, a, a lot of our nations are, are still in conflict with uh, governments today because of that. So it's tough for me to speak on strictly indigenous um, issues related to, to this, um, to this federal election, but with a poverty lens, it's, it's easy because everything we've already heard is everything that we all need, even the Indigenous people. We just want to be equal participants within society. We, we want to be looked at um, equally. We, we don't want to be branded with the Indigenous name. We don't want to be branded or set aside and just in, engage in Indigenous services. We want to be able to have an opportunity to access everything, um, just as everyone else does. Um, but through that, you know, we've, um, sorry, just looking at my notes here. You know, poverty has, poverty looks different within Indigenous communities because we're very communal based, we're very family based. And, you know, we, we look after one another and we help one another. Whereas when we leave our communities and venture into the urban centers, we are now kind of on our own and we're, and we're trying to navigate those systems on our own. So it looks very different for us and it's a big culture shock because of the racism, um, just being the culture shock of being in a new space sometimes, um, as well as sometimes it's a language barrier. So there's a lot of uh, factors that factor into indigenous poverty, but a lot of it is still systemic and it's just built on um, bad relationships in the past. And I think in order for us to move forward and to remove indigenous poverty, which is poverty, indigenous poverty is, po is everybody's poverty. Um, we need to work together and, and you really need to be committed to sitting down and engaging in truthful and honest conversations with one another 
and understanding who we are and understand so we can understand who you are and we can work together to accomplish our goals so that we can eradicate poverty we can make life more sustainable and brighter futures for everyone um so so that's kind of what indigenous poverty looks like it's it's looks like normal poverty it's not you know i, I don't know why we put the name indigenous on it but it's um poverty is poverty no, no matter where we are and it's a tough thing to be through and i think a lot of that has to do just with systemic racisms and our systemic policies and our systemic procedures that we followed um, for a long time and in order for us to really get past those i think we all have to do a deeper dive and look at how we do things the way we do business the way we interact um, is there anything that are causing those barriers that are preventing um, indigenous people as well as non-indigenous people from prevent from accessing services um, though those are kind of really what indigenous poverty is 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 rooted in that systemic racism um, that that's kind of all I got for for this evening. I want to thank you guys <clears throat> for allowing me to attend, and um, I look forward to seeing you all uh, in the future. Thank you, and thank you, buddy. We really appreciate you being here tonight and uh, sharing with us. Um, so now we're going to move into a community discussion. Um, Sam has put some some notes in the chat there. Um, we invite all participants to join us by either entering your question uh, or comment into the Q&A box or using the raise hand function uh, to indicate you want to unmute and ask a question uh, over video. Uh, you may ask a question to any of those who spoke or in general to all the panelists tonight. Please note we do, we do, we do have someone to speak to voter literacy as well, Andrew. Uh, is here with us tonight. He'll be speaking a little bit later after a community discussion. But if you do have any questions about um, how to vote, where to vote, when to vote, or anything to do with the voting process, you can ask him a question about that as well. Um, so if you do have any questions, please feel free to write them in the chat or uh, use the raise hand function and we will we'll get to those right now and have a discussion here for the next half hour. I guess I should just dive right in here. So we have a question from Amy Wing, who asks, how will you ensure that low income rental properties are better maintained and not in dangerous neighborhoods? Um, maybe we'll let, uh, you know, Anne or anybody else who wants to speak to housing and income rental property issues, go ahead and tackle that one. Hi there, what a great question. Maybe I'll just jump in and then anybody else can jump in on that. And so, um, Amy, thanks for that. Um, that is uh, a process where, uh, when I mentioned that housing is a human right, that's a very strong foundation to start the process on because that allows you to have adequate housing. I also, at the end, mentioned the concept of human rights cities. That's a very strong foundation too by Maytree. Um, you can see Maytree's website that has a human rights city where it talks about um, making human rights not just as an add-on, but the essence of say municipal governments and uh, with accountability structures. Uh, it's something that you can ask the candidates at the levels of you know, federal and municipal elections this year exactly that question, how do you plan to do that? Various concepts have come out. You'll see folks like Acorn Canada has come out with a landlord licensing concept um, where um, that landlords must license themselves and renew that on an annual basis, I believe. Um, and uh, in order to meet certain um, performance uh, accountabilities. Uh, we have the concept of the human rights city and municipalities stepping up with various um, measures, uh, policies and um, regulations, etc, bylaws to facilitate that. And uh, I think a key issue is we want to hold that review. I mentioned the review at the end uh, with the federal housing advocate, the federal housing 
advocate department is in place. We just need that one person to launch into the review of the financialized REIT um, uh, model of housing that came into play in the 1990s. There has not been a review. Uh, we need to fast forward that um, two decades is too long to let that pass. Um, we need to ensure that all landlords, the highly profitable profitable, the financialized, as well as um, the smaller ones are all meeting standards, and that um, we do not have discrimination of low income into the poor neighborhoods, as, as you asked. And I believe there was a, um, a, a, um, a submission to the United Nations made by various organizations earlier this year asking for questions to be asked of Canada in regards to uh, key issues involving discrimination, I believe. So this is a solid question. It's uh, your answer is based in a strong performance under human rights, and that's something to, to stand on. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> Anyone else want to add their thoughts from the panel? Okay, I'll leave it. Uh, we do have a very lively discussion happening in the Q and A box, so I was going to ask if Eric and Megan, or Eric and or Megan, maybe want to reiterate some of what has been um, answered in the Q and A. It has to do with um, Eric mentioned that there's the current EI program incentivizes people seeking employment. Uh, so maybe you can elaborate. I know you've answered in the Q and A box, but you want to elaborate on that. Megan's way more articulate than I am, and and uh, yeah, the much better speaker. So I would defer to her. Oh, Eric, don't believe it for a second. Um, so some really good questions from Kathleen, just in terms of what some of the disincentives are um, in terms of income support programs, and we've seen. You know, I think in the public narrative, we, we often hear things like, well, people are just lazy or they'd rather get free government dollars. And obviously, if you're on this call, I hope you know that that's already not true. Um, one of the things that Vibrant Communities Calgary did was to explore what some of these um, disincentives are from a clawback perspective. Um, and so we we know that basically, um, you know, there is a disincentive to work at the rate that our current provincial government anyway, um, is clawing back opportunities and income supports. So for example, if you um, are earning $230 a month, um, any more than you make from that is clawed back significantly. Um, for you to go to work, it's expensive. So you have to pay for things like childcare, like transportation and whatnot. And so you are disincentivized to continuing to earn any more dollars if half of that rate is getting clawed back. So there is a lot of disincentives inherent in our income support programs that um, that we encourage you to take a look at. I will put an income support policy brief that Vibrant Communities Calgary and the Social Policy Collaborative of Calgary put together that I'd encourage you to look at and you can let us know if you have any questions. Eric, is there anything you wanted to add to that? No, I was just going to point it out to Sam, like, see what I mean? You're much more articulate. You're the better half of this relationship when it comes to explaining things to people. Awesome. Okay, we do have a question for Jason. Do you think we need to redeploy funding to schools to address child and intern family poverty in a frontline manner? Or would you like to see a collaborative approach with places like say a food bank? based out of a school? That's a great question. And I think that when you look at um, the idea of sort of a comprehensive approach to the way that you would you would look at poverty within a school, whether you have the access of a school, a food bank to, uh, to give food out at that facility would be, you know, it might take away some of that sort of in, inability of some people to access a food bank in another area. Um, a lot of stuff that I saw that I read from uh, Public Interest Alberta and some other areas as well is there's an element of shame 
to it as well. We need to destigmatize that idea of needing assistance because we all need assistance at some point in our lives and any kind of idea, but also looking at uh, sort of a comprehensive model that we also want to be able to address other areas um, within a person's life and being able to bring in supports from different levels, whether it might be a municipal government, a school community through the school authority or provincial or even federal support for that as well, that we're addressing the needs of people, not just, you know, education, but uh, it might be a means of having uh, some sort of healthcare availability at a school and building all those models in at once so that you can hit those needs that people will need or will have at that one exact point in time. I would um, also like like to second that there was two issues raised there. There was the education, and also um, related to food. What what I would love um, to kind of ensure that people are are leaving with today is that food banks are like the, that is our emergency response. If someone comes to the Alex needing emergency food, we obviously give them food. Our first response after that is, "Have you been to the food bank?" But the food bank is is supporting people and catching people before they they, they fall before they are that that government safety net um, that that is a charity that's ended up catching people because of um, income insecurity. So I I truly um, speaking from the other side, um, I, I would see that as a collaborative approach. And when we see food banks now in the future. Um, it would be for crisis scenarios. It would be for um, like natural disasters, um, like a, a real eradication of one thing, and it won't be down to to income. So, if we really focus on supporting and changing the way we look at um, what our basic needs are, what our, how much our basic needs costs, hopefully a lot of a lot of what we've spoke about tonight will just disappear. Yeah. Does anyone else want to add on to that one? Okay. We have a kind of a doozy of a question. Uh, and I'll put it to everyone in the panel. I think. Uh, so Garnet asks, for too many years, I've seen governments of all types try to make decisions on the basis of what can, we can afford, and we can never seem to afford to do much. Is it time to take everything on all at once and bring people out of, ec people out of economic health, mental health, education, et cetera, poverty, so that everyone has access to all these things as a basic right, or should we focus on a particular area? So I don't know who wants to start with that one. I, I can take a stab at it. I I think that um, you know I, if the, it's a good starting point to actually take all those issues from a, a, a human rights uh, lens, because I think that that um, solves a lot of the um, issues in 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 way that we can actually deal with it. Um, I think the starting from a premise that everybody should have access to all those. Uh, public uh, um, services and, and that we should all benefit from the public good is a, is a good starting point. Um, I think that's why when I talk about healthcare, I'd like to talk about it from that values perspective because it is a human right. We all should have a, a right to access healthcare. We should all have a right to access uh, education and so forth. So it's a good starting point. Um, how we tackle those issues is, is the million dollar question. Do we do it uh, as a issue based um, fight or, or do we do it all at once? And um, it's a good question for candidates because I, I think it kind of shows 
how um, they would be willing or able to kind of impact change in any of the role that they would undertake as, a, as an elected official. But, but for me, it's, it goes all hand in hand. Everything is a domino effect. And if we don't deal with poverty, if we don't deal with mental health, if we don't deal with homelessness, then the domino comes crashing down at the end of the day. And it's, it's that uh, downstream impact that we are always trying to deal with. So um, I think in a lot of ways, we need to, to address all these issues as a, um, as, as a bigger issue of human rights. Hi, maybe I could jump in and just, you know, um, enthusing on what Sandra has just mentioned. Yes. And maybe the thought is um, that we look at each of our areas. What is the urgent? What is the immediate that we absolutely must have in every area? What is the stop the bleed that we can't do without? And then we do the short term and, and what is easy? What can we make happen right away? And then we we handle the short-term emergencies, and then we work on the human rights basis to make a permanent long-lasting solution that's, that's better for everything. So that's why I say with rent this year, for the large companies, they are highly profitable. They survived the, the COVID pandemic excessively well. There is absolutely no need for a rent increase this year. If you look at their financials, they don't need to raise rents by $100. That $100 can be used for food. That $100, instead of waiting for the ultimate rent increase notice, save that mental distress and, and don't even give it. That's something that I think the large landlords can step up. They can give back to Alberta this year. Okay, that, that's what I would ask of them. Because if you think about it, when you're keeping $30, $20, $40, $40 $185 per month rent increase in the hands of renters, you're, you're allowing them to help themselves. So food security and mental health, but you're also allowing that money to be spent in the local community to, um, to, to help businesses in the local community, whether it's buying pizza on a Friday or just the food you need. Or, or a gift or whatever that instead of with financialization, um, it's distributed by um, it, um, to holders of the real estate investment trust units trading on the stock exchange. And then that's out of the local community here, most likely. So I'm thinking that um, I think we should all take a look at what is the urgent and what is we need to do most for each person in each of these areas. And, and move with that and ask the candidates to stop the bleed for all these issues, right? Just a thought. Anyone else want to take a stab at this? Um, I can, Sam, just really quickly. Um, I always have this idea and this belief that budgets are value statements, right? We put our money towards the things that we value within um, like your own home budget or school budget or provincial or federal budget, that they're value statements is what we believe in. And so when you look at Garrett's question, it's a really good one, because I think when you have um, issues as the others had stem that come as an emergency um, or things that are systemic, you also have to look at the symptoms of how you got there and what brought you to those moments. And so with a lot of the issues that we're talking about and that you see here and you see those UNESCO uh, developmental goals, hit on all of them at the same time, because you address uh, mental health issues, you're also going to address um, income issues, you're also going to address food security issues, you're also going to address educational issues and housing. Um, they all are sort of, you know, brought in together that way. And so I think that it's a, it's a comprehensive approach to it as well. And if we value it, um, we hold our, our political leaders to account on it. I think those were great, great answers. Um, we did have a question uh, from Marcy, and she asked a very loaded question about if uh, our political leaders, she specifically named one, but I won't, but if our, um, the party leaders are going to treat people with disabilities equally. And that is a tough question to answer because uh, history would show no. <laughs> um, 
but we can keep pushing forward. And I think that that's, this is the time and the space to really demand that we do. And as we've been saying, taking a human rights uh, approach to all of these issues is what we need to do as a country, um, especially being as wealthy as we are. Um, but I, I would like to hope, Marcy, and I think that's where uh, maybe when the candidates come in, they probably can't speak on behalf of the leaders, but uh, I think beyond electoral politics, there are attitudinal barriers that keep people with disabilities from being uh, treated equally. And that isn't necessarily all on our politicians. While they can definitely support and improve those conditions, uh, it is an overhaul of our culture that is required to make sure that everyone um, is treated equally, um, including people with disabilities. So I don't think that was necessarily the answer you want to hear, but that's I'm happy you're here. Uh, we need to keep pushing forward and keep putting the pressure on folks. I don't know if anyone else wants to answer that question. But. Thanks, Sam. Uh, we have another question in the chat from Heath. Um, so I'm just going to read it out. Um, with the income disparity, we live in resulting in growing poverty. What about the double-edged sword of it that for economic recovery, not addressing poverty results in society as a whole with the economy being incapable of recovery? So I guess this question's about the relationship between poverty and the economy. And um, I'm happy to be hearing from, from any and all panelists who wanna tackle, tackle that big one. No takers. Jason, do you want to take a take a stab at it? I was just trying to find the question again because it was a really long one. <laughs> Can you just repeat it for me? <laughs> for sure, for sure. Yeah. Don't Sorry, it's 7:30. I'm I'm my brain's done. So it's all good. Yeah, yeah. I'll repeat it. Um, yeah, thanks. With income disparity um, resulting in growing poverty in society, what about the relationship between economic recovery and tackling um, poverty? Um, so it's a bit of a double-edged sword. How can we tackle poverty and economic growth in the economy at the same time, basically? Um, that's a really great question. And I think that uh, I'm, this, I'm just talking sort of off, off the top of my head and just some of the research that I've been doing for tonight's event and then just things that I've heard um, as you learn is that the fact that we need to I can't remember who addressed it earlier. The fact that uh, the, the, I think that's actually you, Brad, who said at the top of, of this was that how the pandemic has um, impacted women greatly and uh, has been a real impact in how, um, you know, women have been um, having to, to stay home or they've lost income or childcare is an issue. And so I think one of the key elements that we need to look at uh, right now in terms of answering an economic recovery and looking at poverty is finding a way to address um, uh, issues to make sure that women have the access to all the sources and supports that they need in order to be able to um, participate, if you will, if, to say it that way, in the economy, because we know that uh, we've seen huge impacts on uh, on that. And I, I recall doing um, some representation work on behalf of the Canadian Teachers Federation with federal MPs here in Alberta to talk about how the federal government can support um, women through the pandemic and childcare that, you, as you saw in the last little bit, has been uh, a big issue as well. I just, maybe, go ahead, Sandra, go ahead. I'm just going to be really quick. Sorry, Anne, I didn't know you had put your hand up. Um, for me, is is um, it's the time for us to make significant changes in the way that we treat people in our society um, is now. Uh, we can't go back to the normal way of doing things in areas such as seniors care or, or even addressing the inequalities within our healthcare system or the inequalities within our, our society as a whole. Um, if, we have, if, if we've learned anything from this pandemic is that we need as a society to have uh, stronger public services, stronger um, systemic um, 
safeguards, I guess, for for people um, that um, because we were all in this together, but yet we were not. There was so many disparities that were shown throughout this uh, COVID pandemic that any type of recovery needs to address those shortfalls that we that were uh, highlighted by this pandemic. Otherwise, we're just wasting all the lessons that we could have potentially learned from this. And it has to include um, real change for us to move forward. Thanks, Sandra. And did you have something to add to that answer as well? Yeah, just on the thought of income disparity, um, that is a huge issue that um, destroys um, uh, economies and societies. And so Calgary is known to be, there was a research report, um, um, uh, housing in the top biggest cities of Canada a while back. And uh, Calgary was identified as having the highest income disparity of all the large cities in Canada. And what that does, if you don't address income disparity, um, you, you do, um, uh, as the question alluded to, you do not have the recovery, the economy, uh, the economic prosperity that you need to have. And you have, for example, in Vancouver, uh, they're becoming more unlivable in uh, due to the high rents and the high cost of housing, that kind of thing. And that way is also in, in uh, Calgary. We have to take a look at that we don't need to transfer with higher rents income from the lower and middle class, middle income earners to the higher income earners. We don't need to do that. We don't need higher rents at this time. Um, taking a look at Stats Canada, there was an interesting article that came out a couple of years ago um, that referred to the income disparity. If we take a look at the bottom 90% of income earners in Calgary, that medium income for um, 218, the, the latest year available is 36,500. That's pre-tax income for tax filer. So we, it shows that um, there is that's the, the medium income that we need to address. And we need to ensure that those folks and those lower and um, higher um, are able to prosper in this uh, recovery. Just like Sandra said and Jason said, it needs to be a recovery for all. Otherwise, it's not going to be uh, 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 the, the recovery that we need to see. I know we have to move on, um, but I am really eager to to say one last thing. Um, we when when that question came up, it did take me a while to kind of figure out the, all the nuances. There were so many parts in there. Um, one part that really stood out to me was that the economic part, like how do we support one part but also keep the economy going. Um, one thing that I always am I'm really interested in, like weird stuff, but with the aspect of what GDP, like GDP was created in like the 1940s. It's a world war kind of effort to show what the economy was doing and whether it was going up or down, it was really simplified. It was really like quick made and it was it, it was a means to an end for post-war recovery. And we're still using it as a kind of measure for our economic success 80, 90 years later. Um, so, yeah, like just just posing that, just to uh, let let you let you think on that. It's not an answer to your question, um, it's just maybe offering a different way of looking at it. Yeah. Thanks, Danielle. I think Megan, go ahead. I'll just jump in for thirty seconds. Although Danielle, you've really I didn't know that, and that's really amazing, interesting info. Um, from a vibrant communities perspective, we've been thinking about policy, um, like just quick policy wins in order to maybe address some of the income disparity, um, particularly as we recover from COVID, which we're certainly not out of. So one would definitely be on indexing in terms of income support programs. We need to make sure that they're indexed to keep pace with inflation. And we know that we're seeing these spikes in inflation um, that are really having a huge impact on people's ability to meet their basic needs. Um, creating minimum wage policies that uh, address living wage and not just minimum wage is absolutely a policy implication for this as well. And then equity frameworks in terms of planning and capital investment from a federal level into capital infrastructure for provinces and cities is, is another way to actually uh, remedy some of this quickly from a policy perspective. So I just wanted to offer those quickly. Thanks so much, Megan. Um, so we're going to do one, one more quick question. Um, 
uh, from Robert here. How might each of you comment on corporate welfare servicing their basic need for profit? And uh, ugly question regarding the view that corporate economics is the only economics worthy of national attention. Um, so it's uh, also another big one just to close it off. Anybody want to jump in on corporate welfare? It's a big area in, uh, in healthcare. We see that in seniors care where we not only help to, um, at least in Alberta, where we not only build uh, these facilities and provide them with 50% uh, capital costs under the Affordable Supported Living Initiative, but then we don't own the, the, the facilities. And then we continue to pay them uh, for operational needs. Uh, while they charge people for everything that it's not covered under the operational needs. So, um, and then these, these companies never have to show their books. Uh, there's no accountability or transparency as to where the money goes when once we paid it. And it's the same thing with home care, where we have seen aggressive privatization. It's the same thing with, with any uh, of the upcoming contracted out services that we will be seeing in this province. And so nationally, um, the federal government definitely has a role in, in ensuring that Albertans are, or even all Canadians in different provinces where this privatization is, has a stronghold is that, uh, you know, that we, we basically abide and actually implement the Canada Health Act that prevents all these, um, uh, the corporate welfare to, you know, when we talk about accountability, when we talk about fiscal, being fiscally responsible, we always find that um, most governments that think that way don't really act that way. Um, we don't, as taxpayers, we have no accountability. There is no accountability as to where our money goes when we contract out these services. So if you're going to have that kind of um, role for the private sector, then there has to be more accountability and, and for us to be able to see the books and the numbers and, and how it is that we're supposedly going to be saving when we contract out our public health care system. It's, it's a really point of contention for me. It makes me really angry. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much, Sandra. Maybe I'll, I'll just say one thing. If I understand the question right, it's kind of the role of for-profit in, uh, in your area of concern. And um, I'd like to bring uh, to the thoughts a recent study by the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, How to Build Affordable Rental Housing in Vancouver, where they mentioned that it is um, they say uh, by Mark Lee in March 2021, it says um, to really get a major build out of affordable housing, we need to stop relying on the current private for profit approach in British Columbia and Canada. And so this brings thoughts um, to, towards uh, in the study, you can uh, read it. Um, it shows that how nonprofit can actually build cheaper <laughs> than for profit. And this is why I really want to encourage this review of the financialized REIT landlords, uh, because I'm looking at costs going back for Boardwalk before it became a real estate investment trust. And I'm seeing that in 2001, its operating cost was $200 and its rent was $694. Its net operating income was 71%. I know myself when I took this um, place that I'm renting right now in December 1997, three months later, I received my first rent increase. So I asked for the rent history. They gave it to me. And for seven years before, um, for seven years, the rent stayed static at $600. Um, they gave me the, the rent history even before they purchased the building in 1995. I wondered why it, a rent could stay static at $600. And it's because, uh, At that time, it's appear, apparently the costs were that low. In 2001, as I just mentioned, the financial reporting of Boardwalk shows that its operating costs per unit were $200. So I'm thinking we need a review of the financialized REIT landlords, uh, of, of the REIT model, I should say, the financialized model of renting and housing to take a look at the cost. Because I'm thinking the new model going forward, three items, three factors, uh, of, um, housing as a human right, uh, the pre-tax income of households and um, costs that uh, rather than profits for housing in the future. So just, just some thoughts to throw out there. And Thank I should you. mention just one final thought. 
the person that had my place had my apartment before I took it was apparently a senior. So I'm getting toward a I'm getting towards that stage retirement age, and I just like to have my place for you know several years longer still. Thanks. Thanks, Marjan. Uh, we will now move to our candidates who have requested to speak, um, and we are giving you each one minute. And I will be pretty strict about that because we have an incredible presentation by Andrew we want to get to before the end of the night. Uh, so we're starting with Morgan Watson. Hi. Um... I actually learned a lot from this uh, panel today, including the um, including reminding me of, of a few things that were on the back burner for me that um, I really should be on the front, such as uh, farmer care and the need for or for a rent freeze before. Um, while well, I was planning to bring in uh, to uh, vote for uh, or try to bring in a universal basic income to actually um, handle all of these issues uh, holistically, such as food insecurity, housing, and um, and just extreme poverty. And um, I felt it would be good for entrepreneurship as to actually have um, an, a replacement for the income support program where you could actually earn all you, as much as you want and use just a basic ground floor for everyone. I figured it'd be the less um, really effective way to, to actually spend our taxes. But um, I've learned a few things that I need to back under my platform here too. And thank you for having me. Um, basically, I do differ. I should have mentioned I do differ a bit from the um, from the Libertarian Party as a whole, but um, social policy is about the same. And uh, I think that's my minute. We have Hugo joining us. Oh, I went too fast. Oh, okay. I guess you can hear me and you can see me. Great. Uh, the only thing I want to say, um, all the topics that was uh, touched on tonight are vital, they're crucial, they're important. What I don't, and I, I know, but still, these are information that has to be in the mainstream media. Because what I find is uh, all the people who need the support or impacted somehow continue to vote against their own interests. So, this information, the panel that you brought forward, are, are vital. How, how I would want to know more, and I want to see this every day because a lot of people don't seem to understand the powers they have and how they could really impact change. So I implore and I do appreciate all the people who, who had all that information. I would like to see this become an uh, everyday thing so people know that there is help and there are people out there that could really uh, is fighting for them. How, how is that? that? That's what I find. We're not hearing it in the media enough. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And we have Naomi. Thank you very much. I'm, uh, I'm not going to go through the laundry list of the Communist Party platform. You know, a great many of the points in it are already addressed many issues that have been, you know, so clearly laid forward today. But I, I just want to talk about the fact that. We are a wealthy country. There's a great deal of wealth that available that could be put into all of the social programs at once. There's no need to have to pick and choose and prioritize and give anything up. We don't have to think of it from a point of view of scarcity. If we nationalize the, you know, the major sort of wealth sources, the major corporate wealth sources are the energy sector, the banks, and so on. If we tax the other corporations, if we cut the military budget by 75%. There's an enormous amount of wealth available that can be put into all social programs at once. Um, you know, I really hope that all the different um, organizations that are working so hard and you know have so many, you know, they have the ideas about how to solve the problems. But I hope none of them are ever filled into um, fighting each other, thinking that they have to make a case that they're that they're special. Uh, is more important than everybody else. It's we can meet all the specialists all at the same time. But also, I, was, uh, I just want to also emphasize the, the, the question of national nationalities and marginalized communities. That indigenous self-government is the a way forward to redress, you know, the many crying historic uh, injustices and inequalities. Um, really put an end to. Um, the, the racialization and nationalization of, 
of poverty. Thank you. Thank you, and we have Kevin Hunter. Hi there. Um, it's so important. Um, I want to thank you for organizing this. Um, sorry, just trying to get my camera here. Uh, so important that uh, this was organized. It's a, such a good antidote to the typical election where parties that operate like cartels make promises they have no intention of keeping. Um, and more of this is, like Sam raised the question of how do we hold people accountable, more of this work is really important. Um, our thoughts on the subject of the Marxist-Leninist party, to simply sum up, stop paying the rich, increase funding for social programs. And some of the ways the rich are paid are, are straightforward, and you know it, like buying a troubled pipeline, uh, but also how much is spent on war and aggression internationally. Uh, Sandra Azukar gave the example in long-term care of how the rich are paid uh, through all of the incentives to get long-term things built, uh, long-term care facilities built. But also, I'm a teacher, so I think about education and how things like the vaccines that are created, that is only possible with an educated society. And I would argue that like that vaccine, that intellectual property belongs to the whole of society. But we allow the big pharma billionaires to cash in and make billions by claiming it as their own social product. So that's another way in rich in way in which the rich are paid. Um, so that's probably my minute. So and thank you very much for uh, having us and www.cpcml.ca I'll uh, throw in there. Thank you. Thank you. You are all very, being very timely. I appreciate it. Uh, Deb. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to start off by saying my name is Des Visnet. I'm the NDP candidate here in Lakeland, and I'm joining you from Treaty 6 territory. Um, I want to thank all the panelists for the work that they're putting into not only tonight, um, but also in their day-to-day -day lives and the advocacy that you guys are working on. Um, tonight has been incredible. Um, there's many things that have resonated with uh, situations in my life. I grew up in relative poverty and throughout my adulthood, I have lived paycheck to paycheck. And so I understand firsthand the struggles of not having that security in my income. And I've seen how it affects the people around me, um, my friends, my family members, my coworkers and my community members. Poverty is something that has never been uh, shied away from me. I've, I've been very much aware of it for my entire life. And that's why I'm here. And that's why I am, I'm so happy to be here on tonight's call listening and, and getting the chance to hear from all sorts of different perspectives. Um, I don't have too much else to say besides that I, I really appreciate the work that, that's been put into tonight and that as an individual and as a candidate, I'm going to continue to look into these things and to learn more. Um, and yeah, that's really all I had to say. I just wanted to thank you guys so much and just let you know it, it really resonates um, with me personally through my own life and um, through my own life experiences. And I'm looking forward to building a better Canada with all of you, no matter what partisan you're from. Thank you so much. And we will close off with Peggy Askin. Sorry for the delay. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of points. One is on the question of basic income. Quite a few of the speakers have dealt with this and dealt with what a difference it makes to poverty. Um, one, I think it's important that this basic income be an income that is actually higher than the average wage that a Canadian worker makes, the average standard wage. Reason being because of all the extra costs that come, for instance, when one has a disability. So that I think is important. I think the point has been made here by Sandra and by Kevin that um, there are many ways right now that the funding for these things can be dealt with. That is stop giving billions and billions and billions to corporations in various ways and increase investments in all social programs. The other point I wanna make, whether it's on the question of basic income, affordable housing, 
I want to make the point that I think that the issue for us as Canadians is to empower ourselves, rely on our own forces, no matter what front we're fighting on. Because we've seen the recent example in, in, in Alberta with the doctors, they took on the issue of protecting Albertans. There's many, many examples. We fought over the years with, on the question of AISH and we've increased it nowhere near what it should be. But the issue to me is none of these parties should get a majority because they shouldn't be given a free hand to essentially keep paying the rich. So if we rely on our own forces, empower ourselves and work very hard to elect our own peers and put an end to a party system that disenfranchises people. So I think this has been a tremendous forum and I'm very, very pleased that you, uh, uh, that you organized it. For instance, I let my own housing association, Norfolk Housing, where I live, know about it. They put it on the Facebook page. And I hope that many, many people watched it and that uh, we can all continue this work of uh, dealing with our own needs and concerns and not relying on promises that are broken every day, including the fact that we're having this irresponsible pandemic election. Sorry if I went over, Sam. That's okay. <laughs> All right, um, our last portion of the evening is gonna be hearing from our friend Andrew to talk about voter literacy and logistics. Uh, Andrew is from Apathy is Boring. He is the digital engagement coordinator for Apathy is Boring where he spends a lot of time coming up with uh, some fancy ideas to connect young change makers from across the country online and spreading the good word about democracy. Over to you, Andrew. Uh, thanks, Brad, and thanks everybody for being here. Um, it's kind of a strange spot to be in because uh, usually we talk to young people, making sure that they're out to vote. As a lot of you might have heard, um, young people are make up. It's in the news a lot that young people make up more a greater and greater portion of voters. Somewhere now, stats saying eighteen to forty years old uh, make up up to forty percent of voters now. Um, so why am I here talking about talking to a crowd listening about poverty and disability and, and stuff like that? Um, Colleen here, who I met last election two years ago, uh, mentioned to me that we follow the same kinds of paths in helping young and helping people get involved and, and get, know their rights and realize their you know ability to vote and stuff. Um, a lot of that is to do with plain language. So. Um, we started back in 2004 and many campaigns later, somewhere in the middle, we were talking about dressing down democracy. So um, a lot of young people are turned off from political news. Um, they don't want to deal with the political rhetoric. They don't, they don't care for the jargon. Like it's all yap, yap, yap. And they just want to know who to vote for. Um, this is kind of basically the same idea that um, our friends living with disabilities and living in poverty deal with, right? They, they need to know info. They need to know where to vote. They need to know how to vote. Um, they have special um, requirements. And so we were helping them. Um, motivation, so there's two things that keep people from voting. One is motivation and the other is access. Motivation, you know, it takes a friend or somebody influential to help them get to that point, you know, talking about it's politics, but not talking about politics. So we usually frame it as talking about community or um, improving their lives. Access is something that we can help with in that, you know, if somebody wants to vote, we are going to find a way for them to do it. We work with Elections Canada um, to make sure that you know the options. So a lot of the past two weeks, they've been talking about, about on-campus voting not being available. Um, we were saying, while well, media has been completely focused on this and the outrage, uh, we were just saying, let's look at the other options, okay? Let's move on. Um, let's not worry too much. There are other things we can do. So that's why um, I spent the last two years, I guess, building the idea of how we'll be going to present this stuff. Um, and it is basic. If you go to our website, electionapathyisboring.com uh, slash election2021, and as you guys have to copy and paste that URL. But um, if you go there, we, we reduce it down to a basic 
question and answer. So find where you find where they fit in. Are you a student? Are you um, out of the pro out of province, out of writing? Are you out of the country? Um, are you currently without a home? Um, do you have disability needs? Are you an indigenous person? So anybody who fits those, we will find a way to break those barriers down and get you to the polls. So if there's anybody who, out there who needs any help, um, definitely look us up. Give us Colleen and a lot, of, a lot of these other people and have my contact info. They can definitely forge you over and we'll do your best. I mean, we've been doing that on Instagram and Twitter, basically answering questions about how to vote. Um, I know there's a bunch, there's a lot of candidates in here. And actually, oh, sorry, before we go back, before I get there, um, I'm gonna refer to a note. If people, like the reason we want, I know it's hard to, you know, if you're living in certain situations that they, like elections and voting, is probably not top of mind. I mean, lots of people are working two or three jobs or whatever, working to survive. Um, voting, like, I don't, that, don't have time for that. Uh, basically, I wanna say like, if, if we need your voices. Um, if people aren't voting, our democracy doesn't work. We, you know, we believe that by including more voices, more lived experiences, more perspectives, um, we can change things. We can shift the way these systems work and we can yield better outcomes for us all. Um, an example I like, to, you know, Brad mentioned in the very beginning, um, when groups come out to vote, people notice. Um, there was a noticeable jump in youth voting from 2011 to 2015. There was a 20 point percentage jump. Um, and we have friends at the Canadian Muslim Vote who advocate to their, the Muslim community to get out and vote, be powerful voices in their community. Um, they started one election and they tried to get candidates to come to their forum and nobody did. But when they came out in big numbers, everybody noticed in the next election, you absolutely believe that every candidate wanted to take part in that forum next time. They wanted to make sure that this community that has a strong voice is heard. So while we don't know while there might not be really reporting or anything that says, you know, people are accessing um, accessibility help at a certain election. I think that Elections Canada will make a point of pointing out out if, you, if they came out in large waves. It's like, you know, there's a huge increase in people needing help um, with hard of hearing, with um, they need a big font or they need a, like an actual aid at the elections office. And then suddenly they're gonna start paying attention. And, one of the candidates mentioned, why isn't this stuff mentioned in the mainstream media? It's, it's exactly that. You have, you have to get their attention, right? This is how you do it. You come out in big numbers, you make a movement, and it, that's how it works. So while we're on the topic of the candidates and how in photo literacy, there's something I really want you to keep an eye out for, and that's misinformation on social media. Like It is maybe more rampant than you, than you know. Um, just last week, we had somebody claiming that you needed to be vaccinated to vote. That is not true. Um, so last message for you guys, as you're, you know, combing through messages and answering things and seeing things, I really want you to um, do your part in making the vote accessible to all. Um, call out misinformation, help people get to the polls, no matter who they're voting for, um, because it's all, it takes all of us to make this democracy work. And that is all my time. Thanks so much. That was incredible. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to everyone who came today to learn and to ask these important questions about the platforms and the issues that were addressed here today. We hope that you can take this information and turn it into action, like Andrew was saying, by being informed voters on the issues that matter to you. We would like to thank all the speakers who spoke about these important topics and thanks to all of the candidates who joined us, those who spoke and those who are in the audience. Um, for to, also for listening and sharing with us um, your insight and your commitment. We will be sending out the recording after this event, um, along with a bunch of other valuable resources. Um, so please uh, stay tuned to your emails to see that. Uh, and I just want to remind everyone that advanced voting does start this Friday, September 10th. Uh, so please. 
get out and vote, vote because your voice matters and this is how we affect real change. So thank you and I'm impressed we are on time. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Good night.